Exposing the biblical principles of what a church should be and manifesting the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the Hour of Faith, originating from the sanctuary of Faith Baptist Church, Altoona, Pennsylvania, 315 40th Street in the Highland Park section of the city. As you participate in today's broadcast, may the Lord challenge your heart with the Word. Welcome those of you joining us by way of radio and television to the Sunday morning service coming to you from the Faith Baptist Church of Altoona, Pennsylvania, the United States of America. And wherever you are today, we thank you so very, very much for the pleasure of your company. And if we can never serve you spiritually, please do not hesitate to contact us. And you can see if you're watching on the television or the World Wide Web, you can see our contact information there on the screen. Uh, we, are, we can be found at www.fbcaltuna.org on the website. And we'd encourage you to go there and just observe some of the things that take place around our ministry. And if we can minister to you through those things, we would love to do it. Also, if, you've, if you have a prayer request or a question about the scriptures... Don't hesitate to give us a call. The phone number is there also. It's 814-944-2894. Or you can email us at faithbaptistaltuna at juno.com. That's faithbaptistaltuna at juno.com. And as I say so very, very often, it is our desire that you know Christ Jesus as your Savior. And uh, the Bible tells us that we've all sinned and have come short to the glory of God. And that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, which means to be delivered from sin, its power, its penalty, and its presence through faith in Jesus Christ alone. We're going into the Christmas season. And... Uh, Christmas is far from what the world thinks it to be. The world looks at it as a time of sales for uh, Sears and Roebuck and Boscovs and, and Kmart and whatever the case may be. And, uh, you know, you, you have a lot of people who will be having parties and celebrations. But, but we remind you that Christmas is much more than sales and buying gifts and having parties. In fact, from the biblical perspective, it's none of that. From the biblical perspective, Christmas is the time in which we celebrate 
the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I say this probably every year, but I don't mind saying it again. Whose birthday are we celebrating? It's Jesus's. Many times we go out and, and spend uh, money uh, to buy gifts for those that we love and maybe even sometimes those that we don't love. Uh, maybe we're trying to get extra points with them or something. But you know, it's the birthday of Christ that we're celebrating. The birthday of Jesus. And so I, I say this every year. If you're going to, to give $1,000 in Christmas gifts this year, and to me that's high, but if that's what you're going to spend for Christmas gifts, then at least give that same amount to the Lord. Doesn't that make sense? And in fact, I would encourage you to give to the Lord first. Many times we, we, we give to other things first. We pay our bills first, we buy our gifts first, and then we say, oh, I, I should give something to the Lord. And we look into our checkbook and there's nothing there. Well, you know what? If we give first to the Lord, there will always be something in our checkbook to give to the rest of the needs. That's the promise of God. Remember, the way for monetary increase for the Christian is giving first unto the Lord. Malachi chapter 3 and verse 10. Many other passages of Scripture teach us that very, 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 very clearly. Now, I don't know what you spend on Christmas gifts. I, I heard on the news, uh, I think it was the other day, and the reason why I said $1,000 uh, is because I heard on the news the other day that the average person on Black Friday spends $1,000. Well, I was far from average by about um, $1,000 because I, I didn't go out shopping. I had a missionary with me from Africa. I spent the uh, fr Friday afternoon with a missionary and with a congressman all afternoon, two great types of people to spend the afternoon with. But the missionary just flew in from Africa. He left Africa on, uh, on, on Friday morning and uh, got in early Friday morning in Dallas Airport and then flew up, drove up here. And he said, I want to see what Black Friday's like. I said, would you like to go to the mall? He said, yes. So we stood at the parking lot of Cracker Barrel and looked at the mall. We did not go to it. And uh, actually, he said, then I don't think I want to go. But, but, and you know, that's fine. It's good. Not a problem with that. But Christmas is about Christ, isn't it? It's all about Jesus, isn't it? So when we plan our Christmas events, whether it's our worship service or our parties or our fun times, let's remember Jesus. You'll note I didn't say let's not forget it. There's a difference. Let's make it positive. Let's make it aggressive. Let's remember Jesus. It's all about him. And what a tremendous time this is for us to be able to witness for him. Remember, it's all about Christ. Back there in Matthew chapter 1, when it was presented to Joseph that, that he was going to be the one who would have the opportunity to be, as it were, the legal guardian of Jesus... He said, Jesus Christ will be the one who will come into this world to save his people from their sins. I can't think of Christmas without thinking of John 3.16. Let's all say it together. Those of you in the sanctuary, as well as those of you joining us by media ministries, let's just say it together and let's just not mumble it. <clears throat> let's shout out John 3.16 because it expresses the greatness of God's gift to us. Let's say it together, shall we? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. What a gift! The gift of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ alone. That's what Christmas is all about. I would encourage you to go to our website and see some of the special activities that we're having around Faith Baptist Church during the Christmas season, uh, particularly the upcoming Candlelight Christmas Eve service. I think this year, if I have it right, Christmas Eve is December 24th, correct? They haven't changed that yet, have they? I think it's December the 24th, as it always has been. Six o'clock, we would invite you to come on out for that particular service. But keep Christ in the center. 
Remember Jesus. It's all about him this time of the year. Lord willing, next week we'll be starting to sing a lot of the Christmas songs that go along with this particular series, this particular time of the year. But we're going to sing number, number 580 right now. And uh, it's a song that's entitled, There Shall Be Showers of Blessing. I was over in Africa for two weeks and it was the rainy season. And in that rainy season, we had a lot of mud. And, uh, but they hadn't had rain in a long time. And last Sunday in church, they, they, uh, they, they sang this song, There Shall Be Showers of Blessing, in Swahili. Now, I'm not going to sing it for you in Swahili, but let's sing it in English and let's lift it up to the Lord. Number 580, There Shall Be Showers of Blessing, standing as we sing. Today, Phil McCauley was to sing for us, but uh, he's unable to be with us today, and uh, so don't worry, I'm not going to sing for you. I, I would not do that, but we are going into the Christmas season, and uh, I kind of think that one of the most beloved songs for Christians as it relates to the Christmas season is Silent Night, Holy Night. A song that uh, was originally sung uh, with, a, with a guitar. And it was done that back in the day simply because of the fact that uh, the organ wouldn't work and so they, they played it with a guitar. Now, uh, we have not rehearsed this. and We've not planned for this at all. But, um, so I'm not going to ask anybody to come up and play a guitar. But what I am going to ask is that we, as we are going into the Christmas season... Let's sing that song, Silent Night, and uh, I'll invite you to stand. I don't even think that we need the hymn book for it. Let's just stand and sing the first verse of that and reflect upon what happened that night out there on the hillside just outside of Bethlehem, six miles south of Jerusalem, when the angels announced unto the shepherds that the long-awaited Messiah had come. 
was born. And it was time to come and worship him. What a night that must have been. As we sing this song, if you can sing parts, bass, tenor, alto, soprano, let's sing it as we lift up to the Lord, silent night. Now, sing it to the Lord gloriously. Silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright, round yon virgin, mother and child, holy Throughout the course of the Christmas season, we'll be singing that song and others as well. Remain standing for the reading of the Word of God and turn in your copy of God's Word to John chapter 1. The Gospel of John chapter 1 today, as I deliver a message entitled, The Glorious Presentation of Jesus Christ. John chapter 1. And I want to read verses 1 through 18. We're going to be looking at all 18 of these verses. But in order to get an overview of it, I would like to read down through it now. And then we will look at each one of the verses as we work our way down through this great chapter. The first chapter of the Gospel of John. Note what the Word of God says. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bare witness of Him and cried, saying, This was He of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for He was before me. And of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. God always blesses the reading of his word to our hearts, and so we're thankful unto God for that. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we come to you this morning, we do thank you once again for your word, which is truth. We thank you for this great passage of scripture that reminds us of the greatness of your son, Jesus Christ. Now, Father, I ask and pray that you will teach us as we look into your word. Your Holy Spirit has promised that he he would teach us your word and we need to learn it. Help us as we study today to understand a little bit more about the greatness of your Son, Jesus Christ, that we may honor him and glorify him and praise him for who he is. For it's in Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. 
You know, Christmas is, is a great time of the year for many, 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 many reasons. But perhaps the greatest reason is that it gives us the opportunity as Christians to focus on the great doctrine of Christ known as Christology. And I just want to pause there for a moment because, as I mentioned back in the, the library before the service this morning, so many times we get involved with different things as it relates to the Christmas season that we forget the main thing, that it's all about Christ. So many times we get involved with things and, and planning and focusing on them that we miss the great opportunity that is right before us to study about and learn more about Jesus Christ in what we refer to as Christology. Christology is the study of Jesus Christ. We fail to focus on the real meaning of this season, which is all about the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, unfortunately, as we involve ourselves with other holiday things, the greatness of Jesus Christ is so often sidelined. As we are beginning the Christmas season, as it were, I know that in many stores they've begun Christmas a long time ago. Uh, you know, before you know it, they'll be putting out Christmas things right after the 4th of July. But as around the church, we are starting to focus on the matters of Christmas. Today, I would like for us to, to introduce this time of the year by working down through the first 18 verses of the great gospel of John chapter 1. Because in this particular passage of Scripture, what we have is a glorious presentation of Jesus Christ right from the heart of God Himself. You say, Pastor, what do you mean right from the heart of God Himself? Well, this is God's Word. It's the Bible, the inspired Word of God. And so what we are reading here is from God Himself and God only Himself through the the Apostle John, who the Spirit of God used to record what we have before us. Now, what we see here in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 18, is really the prologue of the Gospel of John. And most of the major topics that are found in the Gospel of John are also brought out for us by way of introduction in these first 18 verses. And then, from John 1, 19, throughout the rest of the chapter, the rest of the book, we find that these great themes are elaborated upon, and they're taught to us. And so, even as I've been working down through the first 18 verses of this chapter, I've been thinking, my, wouldn't it be good just to, to follow the rest of the book uh, for a period of time that we might learn to understand more about what this book is all about. Because keep in mind that each one of the Gospels present Jesus Christ in a different way. And the Gospel of John presents Jesus Christ as God. And as we look down through these first 18 verses of John chapter 1, we see 14 major revelations of Jesus Christ as God. And we want to look at all 14 of those great statements those great characteristics of Jesus Christ here this morning, not only to give us a greater understanding of who Jesus Christ is, but even to prepare our heart for going into this Christmas season to keep it Christ-centered and Christ-centered alone and Christ-centered only. So somebody once said, or somebody said this morning in prayer meeting that uh, they were going to uh, put down on their piece of paper, 14 points, and see if they can fill in the gaps. Well, that was Dr. Chris Davis, just for the case, if you want to know. We're going to look at all 14 today. So batten down the hatches. This is going to be an exposition, a light exposition of this great chapter, just to give us an understanding of what this Jesus Christ, our Savior, the Messiah, the only King of kings, the only Lord of lords, what this infant that we see so much laying in the manger during this time of the year is all about. The first thing we see here is the eternal existence of Christ. Look at the first part of verse 1. It says, in the beginning was the word. We'll stop there. When we see those words in the beginning, what comes to your mind? The book of Genesis. 
Back in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, it says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Well, it says here, in the beginning was the Word. Now, we have to understand that the Word is an expression of Jesus Christ. But back in Genesis chapter 1, when it says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, Jesus was there. There are many ways that we know that. But one of the ways that we know it is because the Hebrew word for God back there is Elohim that speaks of the plurality of God, the triune God. So right back there in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, we have, as it were, the Lord Jesus Christ implied, spoken of as God. And thus, when we come to John chapter 1, verse 1, where it says, in the beginning was the word, it's a reiteration that when God created all things, as is recorded in Genesis chapter 1, Jesus Christ was there. But the point that we want to emphasize is that Christ existed before the time and space of the universe was created. He didn't just come into existence when he was incarnated or when he was born. No, he existed in eternity past. And when we come to the Gospel of John, we find that he is referred to as the Word of God, which is an expression that John uses many times. And the term word simply means the expression of a concept. And so when it says that Jesus Christ is the word of God, what we see is the expression of God in every way. And so in Jesus Christ, we have God. As a matter of fact, putting it this way, seeing Christ, we see God. Think of that. Seeing Christ, we see God. Say that with me, please. Seeing Christ, we see God. He is the eternal Son of God. He existed eternity, eternally in the presence of God as God. Because as we look at point number two, we see the deity of Christ. Again, look at verse one. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. You see, in eternity past, Christ, the Word, who is also the second person of the Trinity, was in intimate fellowship with God the Father, <clears throat> the first person of the Trinity, because Jesus Christ is fully God. He is fully God. Nothing less than all that God is, is Jesus Christ. Turn with me, if you would, please, to the book of Colossians, chapter 2 and verse 9. <clears throat> Excuse me, Colossians, chapter 2 and verse 9. One of the many verses of Scripture you might want to keep in, in mind as you go throughout this particular time of the year, where it says this, Colossians 2 and verse 9, For in Him, who's the Him refer to? Christ. For in Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. The point is, all that the Godhead is, Jesus Christ is. Because why? He is God. At his incarnation, Christ took on the total humanity. Total humanity. But he never ceased to be God to any degree at all. He was completely God and completely human. When you turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, it talks about the mystery of godliness. And a part of the mystery of godliness is that God was manifest in the flesh. And we can be thankful for that. Because as he was manifest in the flesh, we are able to see Christ. We are able to see God as we would not have been able to see him otherwise. But it was in that flesh that Jesus Christ went to the cross and died for us, bore our sin on that cross, rose again from the grave, that through faith in him we might have life. We see the eternal existence of Christ. Let's give him praise. We see the deity of Christ. Let's give him praise. Thirdly, we see the creation of Christ. Look at verse 3. It says, All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. You see, Jesus Christ created all things. You know, if our liberal scientists and even our liberal clergy would believe that, they could save themselves a lot of problem trying to find the missing link. You know, I've often said that it takes more faith to believe in evolution than it does to believe in creation, doesn't it? 
God answers it right here. Back in Genesis, in the beginning God what? Created. Here, it tells us, as God, Christ created all things. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. That includes what? You and me. He made us. He made us for a purpose. He made us with a plan. He made us in a special way to honor and glorify Him. But you see, Christ is the agent of creation. Now, yes, as we study the Scripture, we find that that all three persons of the Godhead were involved in creation. You might want to note this and study it through on your own a little bit later on. But God the Father was the architect of creation. He's the one who, who basically, as it were, planned it out. God the Son is the agent of creation. It says right here in verse 3, all things were made by Him. So God the Father planned it out. It's God the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who actually did the creating. But then God the Holy Spirit is the adorner of creation. In the book of Job, chapter 26 and verse 13, it tells us that it is, it is the Holy Spirit who, who garnished the, the universe. And so God planned it, God the Father planned it, God the Son created it, and God the Holy Spirit put all the beauty on it. Uh, you know, it's just like if you're building a, a house, you'll have somebody draw up the plans, you'll have somebody do the major construction work, and then you've got somebody else come in to do the finishing work. We understand that, don't we? And that's just how this great concept of creation took place. But it is Jesus who is the creator of all things. Let's give him the praise. We don't just see a little baby in the manger. We see the eternal existent one. We see the God of gods and the Lord of lords. We see the creation of all things. Number four, we see the life of Christ in verse four. It says in relationship to Christ, in him, in Christ, was life. And the life was the light of men. Christ is the source of all life, is he not? Indeed, he is. There's no life on earth apart from Christ. How do I know that? Because we just looked at it in verse 3, where it says that all things were made by him. Christ is the source of all physical life, but he's also the source of all spiritual life. Yes, the Lord Jesus Christ, as the agent of creation, created all physical life. But aren't you glad for the fact that the moment you receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, He gives you spiritual life, eternal life? And that spiritual life and that eternal life is the life of God in us? We would have no spiritual life if Jesus Christ, the life, didn't give it to us. Oh, thank the Lord for John 14, 6 where Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father, how? But by me. What a Savior. We see Christ is our life. He lives in us through the presence of the Holy Spirit. Let's give him the praise. Then, number five, we see the light of Christ. Verse, verse, uh, verse uh, five. It says, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. I just want us to say that together. Now, you, you, you think I want us to say that together so that we all wake up, right? No, I just want us to say it all together because of, of it. Look, look at it and look at the words. Let's say it together, shall we? And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Now, if you want, you can write over that verse, victory in Jesus. Victory in Jesus. Why? Well, yes, Jesus Christ is the light of the world. We know that. It, it, the Bible teaches us that. There's a whole chapter of John dedicated to that. John chapter 9. But it says, the light shineth in darkness. Now, the light here is a reference to Jesus Christ. Because it says there in verse 4 that he is the light of men. But as light, Jesus Christ is the one who reveals the holiness and the truth and the purity of God. Remember that. It's Jesus that reveals, as it were, the holiness, the truth, and the purity of God. 
That's in contrast to the darkness that Satan presents. Satan presents sinfulness, error, and filth, spiritually speaking. But Jesus Christ gives holiness and truth and purity. In Christ is light. In Satan is darkness. In Christ is holiness. In Satan is sinfulness. And it is Jesus Christ who has come into this world who shows the light of God to all of mankind, revealing the holiness, the truth, and the mercy of God. But look at it. It says, and the light shineth in darkness. Say the rest of that verse with me, please. And the darkness comprehended it. And the darkness comprehended it. And the darkness comprehended it. Darkness represents Satan. Light represents Christ. Satan's no match for Jesus. Satan is no match for Jesus. And when Jesus Christ was on the earth, the darkness of Satan did everything that it could to snuff out the work of Christ. But Christ went to the cross, and Christ died on the cross, and Christ rose again the third day from the grave. And because of Him, there's victory over the grave. There's victory over death. There is victory over the darkness that the devil gives because Jesus Christ is light, and there's no way that the darkness of Satan could ever overcome that. That's why we say this verse should be entitled, Victory in Jesus. Oh, Jesus is the eternal Son of God. He is God. He's the Creator. He's life. He's light. But now look at verses 6 through 9. We have the forerunner of Christ. And you all know who that is, don't you? John the... John the who? No, not John the Presbyterian. John the... Baptist, you're right. I just threw that in to make sure you were awake. John the Baptist. Notice verses 6 through, through 9. By the way, John really wasn't a Baptist. The Baptist church didn't exist back then. Uh, it's really more literal, John the Baptizer. All right? Uh, even Presbyterians can claim that, those of you who are watching and are Presbyterians. You can claim that too or whatever denomination you may be. Verse 6, There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. You see, all men might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light that was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. We already talked about that. John the Baptist was the forerunner of Christ. He was the one who who came to lay the foundation for Jesus Christ so that, as it says, people might believe in Christ, the true Messiah, and be saved and be born again. John the Baptist bore witness of Christ. And we won't take the time, but you might want to read verses 19 through 34, John chapter 1. You know, there were those who came to John and said, Who are you? Are you the Christ? Are you a prophet? Are you Isaiah? Are you Elijah? And of course, you know, John the Baptist said, no, I'm, I'm John the Baptist. But when we study the life of John the Baptist, we see that he preached under the name of Elijah, according to how it was prophetically given in Malachi 4 and verse 5. He came in the spirit and the power of Elijah, according to Luke 1, 17. And he was the Elijah that was to come, spiritually speaking, according to Matthew 11 and verse 14. But he was not the real Elijah because in the days of John the Baptist, the real Elijah was yet to come. That's a study for another time. But what did John the Baptist do? He came and bore witness of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And go down to verse 29 of John chapter 1, where it tells us that as, as John the Baptist was, was baptizing, it says in verse 29, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Say this with me if you would please. Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. That's what John the Baptist bore witness of. That Jesus Christ is the Savior. Jesus Christ is the Messiah. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Praise the Lord. Give praise unto the Lord for such a forerunner as John the Baptist. Number seven, we see the world and Christ. Look at verse 10. It says, He, Christ, was in the world, and the world was made by Him, and the world knew Him, what? 
not. Kind of a sad verse, isn't it? The world in Christ. He was in the world. Now, we can say that, yes, that relates to the incarnation. But remember, as the eternal Son of God, even before he came into this world through incarnation, he was in the world as God. He made the world. He was in the world. Certainly, he was in the world through flesh. We know that. But Jesus knew all about this world. And then it says, and the world was made by him. We know that. But the world knew him not. Christ made the world, this whole planet. Christ was in the world among the people of the world. But the world, the world system, did not know him. Why? Because the world system, under the control of the devil himself, made up of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life, blinded the hearts and the minds of people so that they did not see nor recognize nor understand who Jesus Christ is. And so the world rejected Jesus Christ, but the story doesn't stop there. But because we see again in verse 11, a greater element of the rejection of Christ. Number eight is the rejection of Christ. Look, if you would please, at verse 11, it says, He, Christ, came unto his own, and his own received him not. How sad it was when the world rejected Christ. But look at this, verse 11, He came unto his own. And his own received him not. When it says he came unto his own, it means that Jesus Christ came unto his own creation. That includes all people. He came unto his own creation. That includes all people. But his own people, the Jewish people, received him not. Christ came as the Messiah. Christ came as the King of the Jews. But they rejected him. How sad. And today, the Jewish people are living in unbelief. I'd encourage you, however, to read Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11. And in doing so, you will find that the future of Israel is, is, is good. They can say the best is yet to come. Because there will come a time when as a nation they will turn back to God and recognize Christ as the Messiah. But when Jesus was here on the earth, he came to his own and his own to his own creation, but his own people, the Jews, did not receive him. They rejected him. However, look at point number 11. We see the acceptance of Christ. Verse 12. What does verse 12 start out with? But. Anytime you see the word but, pay attention. But. Even though the world did not know him, and even though his own rejected him, but as many as received him, to them gave he power. I often hear people quoting this, then gave he the power. No, it, it, it's power. Very emphatic. Then gave he power to become the sons of God, the children of God, even to them that believe upon his name. The world has rejected Christ. People in the world have rejected Christ. The Jewish people, by and large, do not recognize him as their Messiah. But thanks be unto God that all who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, all who trust Jesus Christ as Savior, all who are born again, are given the power by Christ to be the children of God. What a, re, what a refreshing thing that is. What a, what a blessing that is to know that when we believe on Christ and when we trust Christ as our Savior, He gives us the power, the privilege to go to His Father and call Him our Father and say, Abba Father. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Through the acceptance of Christ by being born again, we have eternal life. It goes on and in, uh, in verse 11, and it says, I'm sorry, verse 13, where it says, Which were born not of blood, nor the will of flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. Salvation is entirely of God. And when we receive Christ as Savior, we become the children of God. Are you a child of God today? 
not just by creation, but by recreation. Can you say without a doubt that you've trusted Jesus Christ as Savior and that you're born again? Can you say that? Oh, I trust that you can. And I trust that you've accepted Christ and have his great salvation. Number, number, uh, number 10, we see the incarnation of Christ. Look at the first part of verse 14. And the word, we know that relates to Christ, was made flesh and dwelt among us. When did that occur? At the virgin birth. At the virgin birth, Christ took on the true and complete humanity. We call that the hypostatic union. At the birth, Jesus Christ took on true and complete humanity. And at the virgin birth, a profound and miraculous action took place. Think about this. The infinite God took on the finite but remained infinite God. The eternal God took on time but remained eternal God. The invisible God took on the visible but remained truly God. The supernatural God took on the natural but remained totally God. The Almighty God took on meek humanity but remained holy God. When we see Jesus, we see God in every sense of the term. Only God manifested in the flesh so that we can understand who he is. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. He tabernacled among the human race so that we could recognize his greatness. Then we see the glory of Christ. Look at the second part of verse 14. Say those next five words with me, please, please. And we beheld his glory. Say it again. And we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Yes, indeed, when Jesus Christ came to the earth, he was veiled in human flesh. But he was still God. And as Jesus Christ was on the earth, there were glimpses of his glory seen all over the place. And the glimpses of his glory could not be hidden because it says right here that he was, as it were, full of grace and truth. He being full of the grace and truth of God could not veil God's glory totally, neither was that the plan. Everything that the Lord Jesus Christ did in expressing grace and truth through his teaching, through his miracles, through just walking around uh, in that great holy land. Everything that Jesus Christ did showed the glory of God. And then we know that Christ's glory was seen by Peter and James and John in the transfiguration there in Matthew 17 when uh, Peter, James, and John were with Christ and he was transfigured and he also saw Moses and the real Elijah. (laughs) Oh yes, looking upon Jesus, they saw who he was, the God of gods the King of kings, and the Lord of lords. And when you and I spend time in His Word, we see that too. Give God praise. Number 12, we see the grace of Christ. Verses 15 and 16, particularly verse 16, but verse 15 says, John bear witness of Him, we've already talked about that, and cried saying, This is He of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for He was before me. That talks about the eternal Christ. But look at verse 16, and of his fullness have we all received, and grace for grace. Say that with me, grace for grace. Say it again, grace for For grace. grace. Jesus Christ, when he was on the earth, revealed grace upon grace in his teaching and miracles. And his ultimate grace was seen when he was on the cross. Not when he was in the manger but when he was on the cross. Remember, grace is the unmerited gift of God. The fact that God bent over backwards to provide for us a salvation that we do not deserve. And yes, grace upon grace, one act of grace upon grace. I mean, it was just grace and 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 grace grace seen through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. But when he was on that cross, God's grace was poured out to all mankind. Indeed, we thank God for the grace of God that was revealed through Jesus Christ the Lord. Give him praise. Then number 13, we see the message of Christ. Verse 17. It says, for the law was given by Moses, talking about the law represented through the Ten Commandments. 
but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. You say, what is the message of Christ as it relates to Moses? Well, keep in mind that the message of Moses under the law, the message of Moses under the law revealed the demand for holiness according to the standard of God. That's what the law did. It was the law that demanded, that teaches us that that God is such a God that holiness is demanded for us in order to match the standard of God. But we cannot live up to that holiness. Therefore, it took a Savior to make it possible. And as you read through the book of Galatians, you'll find that not only does the law law demand holiness in its teaching, but Jesus Christ being the fulfillment of that law, went to the cross and suffered and bled and died and rose again from the grave so that through faith in Him we might have His holiness. And so you see, the the message of Moses under the law was the demand for the holiness according to the standard of God. But the message of Christ through grace and truth revealed the complete salvation of God and that through faith in Christ, believers are made holy. Aren't you thankful? Through faith in Christ, you're a saint. Some people say you've got to die and be dead for 500 years and then some church will say you're a saint. Oh, no, not according to biblical truth. The Bible says the moment we're born again, we are saint, whoever, made holy in Christ, the message of Christ. And finally, number 14, we have the declaration of Christ. Look at verse 18. It says, no man, no man has seen God at any time. That is, no man has seen the greatness of the glory of God really face to face. You say, what about Isaiah back in Isaiah 6? Isaiah saw a vision of God. A vision. There's a difference between seeing a vision and, and, and really seeing reality. Um, no man has completely been able to look upon God and live, the Bible teaches us, because he is so bright, so brilliant, so glorious. But it says... The only begotten Son, that's Christ, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Just a a moment uh, to make a statement on that phrase, the bosom of the Father. You know, that shows the intimacy and the love that exists between the Father and the Son in all of eternity past, in all of eternity future. And it makes the words of Christ when he died on the cross come into perspective when he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because in the bosom of the Father, there is that intimate relationship between God the Father and God the Son that even you and I can't imagine, nor can we understand. But it says there, look, no man has seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father. Say this with me, please, the last four words of the verse. He hath declared him. That word declared is an interesting word. It's a word from which we get the word exegete or exegesis, which means to interpret and explain. And so what this is teaching us is that as Jesus Christ declared God, he interpreted and declared God for us. So that as we see Christ, we see God. As Jesus said in John chapter 14, verses 8 through 10, you can read it on your own. He said, As you see me, you see what? The Father. Wow. What a Savior. You see the eternal existence of Christ, the deity of Christ, the creation of Christ, the life of Christ, the light of Christ, the forerunner of Christ, the world and Christ, the the rejection of Christ, the acceptance of Christ, the incarnation of Christ, the glory of Christ, the grace of Christ, the message of Christ, the declaration of Christ. Jesus Christ is God. To Him be the honor. To Him be the glory. To Him be the praise for all that He is. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Do you know this Savior is your own? Have you trusted Christ? Have you been born again? Have you called upon the name of the Lord to be saved? Have you? 
I pray that you have. And if you haven't, no better time to do it than today. Simply call upon the name of the Lord and say, Lord Jesus, I trust you to save me. But what is the application that we should draw after looking at these 14 points in 18 verses? Here it is. Focusing on the glory of Christ. I want you to hear this. Don't close your Bible quite yet. You'll miss what I'm going to say. Focusing on the glory of Christ should be the regular effort of the true believer. Did you hear that? Focusing on the glory of Christ as seen in this chapter should be the regular effort of the true believer. Our challenge is to be certain that we never lose sight of the great glory of Jesus Christ, that we in turn might worship Him properly. Christmas season is upon us. Isn't it sad to consider that some people will go throughout the Christmas season and not even think of Jesus? Isn't it? Isn't it sad to think that many Christians will go through the Christmas season and not have Christ in the foremost of their thought process? Isn't that sad? What about you? What about you? What about me? Where will Jesus be in our thoughts, our actions, and our activities during this special time of the year? May we put him in that number one place. May we focus on him consistently. Your challenge and my challenge in in these next few days, working up to the Christmas day, would be to read John chapter 1, verses 1 through 18 every day so that we might grow in the understanding of the glorious, present gift we have in Jesus Christ, the Lord. To Him be the glory. To Him be the honor. To Him be the praise. Our Savior, Jesus Christ, the Lord. Let's stand for prayer. Father in heaven, as we come to you this morning, we thank you for the opportunity that we've had to look into your word today, which is truth. Oh, Lord, it's my prayer that if there's any under the sound of my voice today who has not yet trusted Christ as Savior, that this morning, right now, this moment, would be the time in which they would call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. But Lord, here's us. As Christians, here we are. Forgive us. Forgive us for not focusing on your son as we should. Oh, forgive us for getting distracted. Lord, take this message and through your Holy Spirit, not only teach us these great truths, but apply it to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Our final hymn is number 301, Only Trust Him. And if you want to receive Christ as Savior, we'd love to talk to you. I invite you to come to this altar. We will be here to receive you. If you have another spiritual need or whatever, please don't hesitate to come. Keep this altar open for you to go before the Lord. As we sing number 301, Only Trust Him. www.fbcaltuna.org or write to the Faith Baptist Church at 315 14
with Street Help to the next one. 16602 USA. Till the next time we meet, may our Lord richly bless you as you serve him.